Our speaker is Dr. Jen Owen. She's an associate professor in the departments of fisheries and wildlife and large animal clinic, clinical studies at Michigan State University. Her research efforts have focused on the role of wild birds in the maintenance, transmission, and spread of pathogens, as well as understanding how the demands and stress of migratory periods influence a bird's immune system. So migration, disease, all those good things, right? Uh, she's also the director of the Michigan State Bird Observatory and the center coordinator for the Cory Marsh Ecological Research Center. The Michigan State Bird Observatory is kind of an umbrella organization for the two band, uh, bird banding stations. So it's bird banding, education, outreach activities, uh, which includes the Cory Marsh Ecological Research Center in Bath Township, as well as the Bird Lake Banding Station, also in Bath. Uh, both locations you can do bird banding at, they are open to the public, uh, both in the spring and the fall. The bird lake is open every morning, weather permitting of course, until October 15th, and the Cory Marsh Banding Station is open Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays until October 15th. And there's more information on the table over there, so if you're interested in bird banding and learning more about birds that way, talk to her about that. So anyway, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jen Holman. for having me here. I'm really excited. I'm always excited about talking about birds uh, um, during migration. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. We're good? Okay. All right. So, I don't know if you know, but birds are migrating right now. <laughs> and it's actually amazing because when we think about this, this is um, at night, not right now, but at night, there are billions of birds migrating over us as they're making their journey south. I mean, it's truly phenomenal to think how many birds are flying. And they're flying, most of them are flying at night, which I'll get to. Uh, but over half of 650 um, species of birds that breed in North America are migratory. And I have to say, I've been studying this for over 25 years, and I am still in awe of what migratory birds do and how they do it. Uh, so it's really, I'm extraordinarily excited, I'm always excited to talk about uh, migratory birds. Frank Chapman, he was a curator at the uh, Natural History Museum, and he has this book called The Travels of Birds, a small little book, which I love. Uh, and this is in, in published in 1915. And the statement of birds are the greatest travelers in the world, but unlike human, the bird traveler asks help from no one, carries no chart, no compass, and he or she can go with ease to parts of the world which took no man many years to reach. Which took man many years to reach. Parts of the world which still are unknown to us today. And that really captures, I mean, it is amazing that they do this and how they do it. And this uh, diagram, which you may have seen, this is from Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Each one of those dots represents a species. So it's a, a, all the sort of uh, records, individuals recorded for a particular species. And it's tracking them through the annual cycle. So you get to see their movement. Each, the colors represent seasons. So here this is fall and all the birds as they're moving south. And you can see how far some of them are going. Okay, and then when they start heading back, this data is possible because of citizen science. This is eBird data. Any, how many people have heard of eBird? So this is all eBird data that's generated. So it's uh, records. It's amazing what citizen science um, has done for our advancing our knowledge about birds. So we know that birds migrate. Okay, and. One of the ways that we know some of this uh, is when we see the seasonal changes in birds. Okay, we see that there's birds that are breeding, like that yellow warbler here in the summer, and it's not here in the winter, but yet we have this cardinal that's here year round. And these seasonal changes have been observed, obviously, for centuries, but people's knowledge about bird migration has changed dramatically. So prior to the 19th century, there were many myths that about what birds did during winter. Like, where did that yellow warbler go? Now, Aristotle, who got a lot of things right, but got some things pretty wrong, <laughs> uh, thought that birds transmutated. So this, in Europe, this common red star is a breeder. 
You see it all summer long. And then it's gone. And then you see, whoops, this European robin. Which I just, there we go. And so he thought that the common red star transmutated and became the, American, the European robin, sorry, in the winter. And probably that some of that would have dealt with probably the molt. The birds are going through molt, so they look pretty ratty in the fall a little bit, and so maybe they thought that's when they were transmutating. Well, we now know that these are two different species of birds, and they have different migratory habits, uh, and the common red star is gone, and European robin, which has multiple migration strategies. Okay, so that one was, they realized that didn't happen. <laughs> Uh, it didn't take that long to figure that one out, but this one, um, the other myth too, that birds hibernate at the bottom of lakes. <laughs> Believe it or not, it took almost a couple hundred years for this myth to be developed. Uh, so, and what they did is this was that, um, the fishermen would be having their nets, and they'd be dragging their nets to fish, and they would see all these birds in these nets. So they just were like, well, that's what birds are doing during the winter. They're going hibernating in the mud in the bottom of the lakes, and then they emerge in the spring. Yes, there are issues with that on many different levels. Uh, they actually had the Swedish Academy of Sciences working on a ward system, so they uh, to find out if anyone could actually get proof of bird hibernating at the bottom of a lake. Uh, they didn't get that. Uh, so uh, it did take a while that they finally ruled that birds did not uh, hibernating by the lakes because it actually wasn't physiological possible either. So then it's the question of where do the birds go? Well, in the 17th century, Charles Morton said, well, birds migrate to the moon and back. <laughs> <laughs> what else would they be doing? And the reason why you would think that is not right now, we don't have a moon, but if you go out uh, during peak migration and there's a moon, you take your binoculars and you put it up to the moon, look at the moon, you'll see the silhouettes of birds as they cross through the moon's shadow, moon's light. It's how actually scientists have been recording and documenting bird migration for a long time. You can do it too if you put a big, big, big floodlight and so you lie on your back with your binoculars and a floodlight and you can see the birds go through the light. So we know that birds don't migrate to the moon. <laughs> Uh, sounds nice. But, so now, so they did figure out that birds did migrate and that they migrate down, um, you know, they change where they're spending their time. And the migrations about birds that we know are, some of them are truly phenomenal. The Arctic Tern, longest migration of any bird in the world. We've known this has been the longest migration of any bird in the world for a very long time. We just didn't know that it was this long. For the longest time, they were thinking it was around 25 or 29,000 miles round trip. And now that we have technology to uh, track birds, they're finding out that it's much longer. And the reason it's much longer is actually because the birds aren't taking a direct route. You'll see in the water here, there's areas of green and yellow. Those are areas with very high nutrients, uh, so there's a lot of productivity. And so what they're doing is that these red dots, they're actually stopping and they're foraging and feeding. These are areas where they can get a lot of uh, fat on them. We'll talk a lot about fat today, because we love fat in birds. And so the, they found that they, and they can spend up to a month in some of these places. The bar-tailed godwit, shorebird. This bird can fly 7,000 miles for eight days nonstop. Truly remarkable in terms of its ability to fly. So that, yes, okay, eight days is pretty remarkable. But we think of the, when we think of birds, we think of the big water birds maybe flying long distances. But this little black hole warbler, which is about this big, flies 80 hours nonstop. Now, it, it goes to the Gulf of Maine, and in the fall, and it then will migrate over the ocean, and it goes into its uh, wintering grounds in South America. And they know that it can fly. So instead of going over land, it's a lot shorter just to go over water. So that requires over three days of flying. Now, in order to do that, 
they can't weigh 12 grams anymore. <laughs> they eat a lot. And so within two weeks before they depart, they will almost double their body mass. So that's a period of called hyperphagia, which I'll talk about in just a bit. But they're not the only ones, just as these, all these dots show you, that birds are migrating, many birds are migrating long distances. They vary the distances they fly. And as you'll note, that's a lot of those dots are going over the Gulf of Mexico. And we know for a fact, because actually the lab I got my PhD in, in Mississippi, was tracking the birds as they went across the Gulf of Mexico, swings and thrushes, and we know it takes 30 hours nonstop for swings and thrush to get over the Gulf of Mexico. Hummingbirds also fly over the Gulf of Mexico, by the way. It's shorter, it's better, uh, a little bit faster. So I wanted to again point out this is eBird. It's again the power of citizen science. <clears throat> So when a bird is migrating, so they're migrating between their wintering and their breeding grounds, they, okay, so they are going to do some long distance flights, but they're not doing this nonstop most of the way. Particularly when they're over land, they have to stop. So what's a classic evening is that 30 minutes after sunset, birds kind of make their way up to the tops of the trees, this is on a good weather night, and they'll lift usually up and they'll actually go into the headwind and then you'll see them when if you have an infrared camera on the trees, which we've done, uh, and you'll see them shoot in the direction they're supposed to be going. And they'll fly for maybe five, six hours, and then they land. And they land anywhere. They land whatever place they can find. They don't really know where they're gonna land, right? They're in flying at night. They don't see exactly where they're gonna land, but they need to land. They wake up in the morning, they get a couple hours. They sleep a little bit while they're flying because they do half their brain sleeping sometimes. Uh, and they have to forage. They have to find food. So these stopover sites, these areas where they actually stop, are absolutely essential for the birds to make a successful migration. They have to find food, replenish those depleted fat stores. They have to avoid predation. They have to rest. And they have to maintain their health because this is taxing. Flying long distances, even though they're built for it, still does tax their immune system. It's something I've been studying for a long time that, like marathon runners, birds do suppress their immune systems during these long flights. So they have to find food that helps boost their immune system. They have to maintain their condition because they also are exposed to a lot of novel parasites and pathogens in room. So one of the things I want to point out was this annual cycle of birds. And really what I want to point out is the red and the orange. So we have uh, fattening periods, so right here, for each season. And then you have your migration in red. And so the birds know daylight changes. They, are, uh, they will start to physiologically change. Photo period, the day length is a cue. And they'll start to eat, go through hyperphagia eat a lot, but they also physiologically change so that most of the food that they're eating goes into fat deposits, maybe unlike at other parts of times of the year. And you'll, one thing you'll notice here is that the migration period is much shorter in the spring than it is in the fall. And that is because birds in the spring, they have some place they need to go and they need to get there quick because they need to get there before everyone else does and takes the good spots. Because their success at reproduction is it relies on their ability to get good habitat, get there early, uh, and start breeding because they have such a short window in order to make that, to finish laying their eggs and raising their young. So that's why, so time is everything. And winter is a little more leisurely. So one of the things about this weight, so amount of fat that birds, so our birds don't carry a lot of fat most of the time. I mean, they have um, pneumatic bones, like hollow spaces in their bones. Right? Being light is a really big deal when you're flying. So it's during migration that you get birds that put on a lot of fat. So for example, that cardinal, which is a resident, it its body mass is never really, even winter doesn't go up that much, maybe 5% of its body mass will get into fat. A short distance migrant like the American robin, which not all of the robins migrate. So if you do see robins in the winter, it's not a sign of spring. Um, they were probably here all winter. 
but some of them that do migrate just go to the Gulf Coast and they may only put on 1325. And then there's the long distance migrants that put on substantially more fat. And then you get these birds, well, let me show you a picture, which is kind of, these are birds for life. It's just we took a little bit of water and moved the feathers a little bit so you could see the fat. So this red-eyed vireo, this is fat. That is gushy fat. Like the birds feel gushy in your hand. Um, and so this is a bird that doesn't have much fat. You can see a little bit of the yellow here. The, the pink uh, purple is their muscle. But this is an indigo bunting, actually, a female. And you can see they're just loads of fat. And sometimes they can actually get a sheet of fat that goes from the top to the belly to here. Hummingbirds, too. We've had hummingbirds at our banding station. <laughs> they have a, so everyone that comes to our banding station, we get a bird. We put it on your hand so it can launch off your hand. And so everyone loves that because hummingbirds want feeling that heartbeat on your hand. But some of those hummingbirds, they usually just hang out on your hand. And sometimes it's really hard for them to take off because they're so fat. <laughs> I know they kind of get up a little bit. They kind of <laughs> they're little punch balls. We've had one. Um, so I'm digressing for a second. We had swings and thrush. That uh, so swings and thrushes, but they didn't have any fat on them. Uh, weigh about 24 grams. And it was last year, and it was a southerly wind, we had a lot of warm weather in September, and two weeks, I guess, and birds weren't leaving because there weren't any good conditions for leaving. And so they stayed on the site for a while, and that bird, by the time it left, was 50 grams. <laughs> so <laughs> it was so fat. And Swains and Thrush is a really long distance migrant, they're going to South America. That one could have just gone straight to South America. So in order to get fat in fall, it's different than spring. So in spring, birds are eating. If you're familiar with the lake shore and those nice swarms of midges and along the lake, birds love those. High protein, protein is really important for young, raising young, for producing eggs. But in fall, fruit. A lot of birds that might have eaten just insects eat fruit in the fall uh, because, well, it's there, it's abundant. Uh, it has high energy potential. There is some fruit, not all fruits are created equal, just like for us. Uh, really high energy, really high fat content. They're abundant. I mean, you look outside and you see that um, they're clumped. You don't need to spend a lot of energy to get that food. And they have health benefiting antioxidants. Just like we think about our antioxidants and our glass of red wine that we're having in the evening, or maybe some berries. But, uh, you know, fruits too for birds. So this is really important for them to, um, for their immune system and health. The problem is, of course, there's always a problem. And we just heard as the news that came out from colleagues of mine in Cornell, but that birds are declining. And a lot of this, it's not just on breeding ground, habitat loss, it's not just on the wintering ground, it's also on the migration. Every part of the bird's annual cycle, there's this carryover effect. Events that happen on migration affect their reproductive success. Events that happen on wintering affect their reproductive success. And so we have a loss of habitat. So you can imagine that bird flying and landing, and maybe it doesn't find good habitat. Maybe it has to search or take off the next night and it didn't get a lot of food. That has implications down the line. So there is a lot of loss of stock over habitat. And the other thing is, is there's this invasion of non-native plant species. So fruit quality varies. So not all fruit is good for you. Just, I mean, there's some that is, well, there's a lot of invasive plants. Well, particularly, uh, I'll point out, there's the honeysuckle. This robin clearly is liking that honeysuckle. It may be the only thing there. Uh, that's junk food. That's just sugar. That's not going to have a lot of energy that's going to last for very long for that bird. So that's an invasive plant. Common buckthorn, I say, is an invasive plant. It does have more nutritional benefits. And actually, when there's not native plants, we find that birds will switch to buckthorn. Native plants. So a lot of our native plants are incredibly good, uh, really good at energy. And actually, I have a picture of winterberry here. One, because you see it's um, starting to be beautiful. It's coming out right now. But 
But there's another one that's even more important. That's common spice bush. People have heard of this. That is the best. That's the premier fruit for birds. It is high fat content in that. Stogwood also has high fat content. So this is what we've been studying. So we've been studying trying to figure out what is it that birds during fall, what do they eat? What do they prefer? Are they randomly selecting food? And then how does that affect their health? Because we do, we work in an area with, um, where there's invasive plants. It's hard not to. So uh, this is where the banding station that uh, I run, uh, which is going on right now. Uh, so we have a bunch of, uh, we have these two banding stations. Our primary one is the Burke Lake Banding Station, where we've been doing research there actually since 2009. Uh, and it is in Bath, Michigan, so it's just north of the Michigan State University campus in East Lansing. And it's on the Rose Lake State Wildlife Area, the DNR property. And it is an amazing area in terms of the native site. But we had looked at both the native and the non-native site there. Now we just operate in the native site. Uh, so this is, I mean, it may not mean much to you. How many people here have ever been at a banding station? person okay so a couple people yeah so this is our net array so this is our road you park this is our banding tent and each one of these numbers represents one of these nets where we catch birds which will become obvious for those that have no idea what I'm talking about in just a minute uh, so that's an aerial view of our habitat this is all a wetland right here this is what it looks like in that wetland uh, we have what I call a boardwalk, and other people call wood on um, the ground. Uh, <laughs> took a lot to carry that in there, so I think it's... <laughs> Otherwise, we were, we were sinking up to our thighs. It's a swamp. Uh, it's a beautiful swamp. It's, uh, the diversity of plants is amazing. This is one of the students. Uh, so can you see the mist net? We're catching the bird. Yeah. This whole thing is, a, you can, there's a net right here. You can see the line of part of the net right there. So that's the, hence the name Mist Net. Uh, so where we catch the birds. So she's taking out this robin. So this is one of the undergraduate students, uh, Aya, who's worked there for four years and is now working in Idaho at a banding station. She's been working all over the country. So this is what it looks like uh, when a bird is in the net. So this is a Nashville warbler. Uh, this is the rose-breasted grosbeak, which you try to keep your fingers away from their bill. Um, but they always invariably go for the little bits of skin right between your fingers. And, yeah, that's painful. Yeah. The visitors don't release those birds. Uh, so this is, birds typically go into those nets. They're just flying. It's passive. Uh, they go in and they get kind of caught in this little bucket. and. Most cases, they'll just kind of hang out there. We go check the nets every 45 minutes and take them out. Uh, well, that's why weather is so huge. You can't have it windy, you can't have it sunny, you can't have it cold, and you can't have it um, raining because this is really important. The safety of the birds is our number one concern. This is a tiny video that just kind of shows us our banding tent. We are really high class. Um, <laughs> That's, so now you can see that mist net. This video I already came out and there's no birds in the net when it came out, so. So we take measurements. Um, <laughs> they don't always want to leave your hand, so you do. Um, so this is just, I'm not gonna, I was just trying to show you that beginning part of it. Uh, so you can kind of see the mist nets. Hard to take pictures of them to really show them. But these are bands. So we then catch the birds. We bring them back. We put a band on it. Every bird in North America gets a unique number, and all of that those bands come from one location, the Bird Banding Lab, uh, with the USGS, the United States Geological Survey. And as you can see, there's a variation in sizes, and the sizes depends on the bird species and the size of their leg. Swains and thrush. This is an American red star. They get very different size bands. We put those bands on the birds. Uh, just so you know, this is the bird banding laboratory. You can actually have a fun database to go into because from all this bird banding data, you can start to learn a lot about uh, birds. And it has longevity records, so like recaptures of birds. Like they had one hummingbird, a ruby throated, that they caught. I think it was 11 or 14 years old when they captured it. 
So there's, you can get these really cool records. Uh, so that's really neat. There's a lot of other reasons to ban birds, and I'm not going to have time to go into it too much now, but it really helps us connect wintering and breeding and that and connectivity and understanding where birds are going and coming from is really important in protecting them. So we then weigh, we do all these measurements, we weigh the birds, everyone loves it when we weigh the birds, we stick them down in a PVC pipe. Um, it's, yes, we don't have Kentucky warblers here, this is a Louisiana picture. Uh, but we also look for ticks, uh, and where ticks are typically, this is a bird's ear, uh, and that's the tick right there. Um, sometimes you get the pretty big gorge one, but primarily they're almost like just a, a pencil, like a dot. I mean, larval ticks, and you can have a ton of them in the ear, and we remove them all. We have a de-ticking service that we provide, <laughs> and uh, it's one of the things we advertise to the birds, and uh, <laughs> something's got to come out of this, right? <laughs> and we then take a look at all those ticks. What species of ticks are they carrying? Is it the, and primarily, are they carrying the black-legged tick? And the black-legged tick being the tick that is the vector for the bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi that causes the Lyme disease. And that has been increasing in our area. So for, when we first started, we never had a bird that had the black-legged tick, and a few years ago, we got a few birds that had them, and now we're up to, in Swain, of the birds that have ticks, it's about 15 to 20%. Now there are black-legged ticks, we haven't tested them, so we are. I have a, there's a veterinary student working with me who's now they're about to put it all through PCR. So all the black-legged ticks then get tested for the bacteria, uh, but we, so we don't have that data. Yeah, I work with Dr. Jean Sow, who's in my department as well. She's a Lyme disease um, expert. Then we also, which is always very exciting, is we look at their poop, and uh, so this is. We might have birds in bird bags, but we also then put some of our birds in bird boxes. So you might you put one bird in, you get them out of the net, and you put them in a little compartment with a usually white piece of paper. It doesn't look like this. Uh, and they're there, and we just collect what they give us there on the paper. Uh, so this is actually, um, so we get poop samples, and this tells us what the birds are eating. Because this, is five different samples put together from different birds. Isn't that pretty? <laughs> <laughs> it's a rainbow bird poop. And just in case you were wanting some, I brought you all bookmarks that are this. <laughs> They're not real, not fresh. <laughs> they are a photocopy of real samples. <laughs> uh, so why we do this, this is really important, because we can tell what the bird's eating. So this bird is eating spice bush. That color is always spice bush. The other great thing about spice bush, just like spice bush very smell good, the poop does too. <laughs> uh, not many people believe you when they say, can you sniff this? <laughs> uh, this is dogwood, yellow. There's probably something else in here. This is European buckthorn. This is high bush cranberry. We don't know if it's native or non native. They're hard to tell, those two. And then this is elderberry. So we know this because we've been smearing fruit for a while. <laughs> we go out there and smear fruit on paper. And uh, we're also, I have an undergrad student who's now going to do some genetic validation of all of this. But we've collected thousands and thousands of these samples. And so this is how we um, get our data, which has been really important. So these, and those are the fruits. I guess I sort of preempted myself because I was supposed to show you that, show you this. Uh, so just to give you, well, I can just go through here. All right, so these are the different fruits. So you have your spice bush, dogwood, buckthorn, high bush cranberry, and your elderberry. Elderberry is always the first to go on our site. Birds love it. It's before the spice bush is actually even ripe. So what we've done is actually we've counted. So we want to know, if we want to really know our birds choosing fruit, selecting certain fruit, we need to know what's available. Because they could just be out there just taking whatever they can find. 
So what we've done is we've actually characterized the, the habitat and we've looked at how much of the fruit is available. Uh, and I should say the plants that fruit, because not every year is a fruit the same amount of fruit that we get. Uh, so this just shows you the site, the composition. The blue are non-native species. Uh, primarily we have native species. The study I was talking to you about where we looked at non-native and native, uh, that actually is not reflected. There's a second site um, for that. So this just showed you the great dog was very uh, prevalent, winter berry, which isn't really important for our stuff because the birds don't eat it. It's much later. Uh, it takes a while to get right. So then, what is their diet relative to availability? So this is what, this is the information we want, because if it was random, then the bird's selection, their diet, would reflect what was available. And as you can see, uh, okay, so buckthorn may be close, elderberry is not, we don't have a lot of samples I'm going to point out from elderberry because it's so early in the season, but if you look at spicebush, uh, relative to its availability, it's highly preferred. Uh, plant. Dogwood, you may notice that it's exactly the opposite. And this is because we didn't know that dogwood was yellow when we first did this study. So this is data. So this is just to point out how we're learning each time and we're refining our methods and we have to go back and sort of revise what we thought was happening uh, with more data that we collect. So I did want to point out there's a lot of interannual variation. This might seem like a busy slide to you, but uh, this is just showing you fecal samples over four years, and this is the habitat. Uh, so basically the dogwood being here, common winterberry, common spicebush, elderberry, and so forth. And then this is a Swainson's thrush, and this is basically what their diet looked like over those four years. And you'll note that on 2012 and 2013, it was a lot of spice bush, but then in other years it wasn't. That's because there's literally no spice bush fruiting those two years. There's none available. We don't really know why. If anybody here does, I want to know because this is something we're noticing. We have years with high spice bush and years when there's none. And I think it has to do with precipitation, like how wet the spring is or winter, but I don't know. I don't have enough dates. <laughs> we need long term data. And then uh, catbird is, uh, again, you can see a lot of variation. Here you see in 2012 how much spice bush catbirds were eating um, right here. And then again, very little. And like I said, I told you buckthorn becomes important when there's not spice bush, so that's what this brown is here showing. So why some of the things that we're studying in terms of their health? Uh, well, antioxidants is one. I study a lot of different things with health, I should point out. I'm not going to share all of it with you. If you're interested, I'm happy to talk about it if you're here for lunch or whatnot. Uh, because we do study parts of the immune system. And, but this, we look at their antioxidant capacity. So this is the bird's ability to mitigate those free radicals that we all hate, that are bad for our immune systems, cause us to age. They're just they did tissue damaging free radicals. And so we wanted to know if birds are eating, if they're eating in native areas or native plants versus invasive non-native plants, how are they doing in that capacity? So again, these are these, they um, call these um, you know, tissue damaging, they quench, they take up uh, oxygen species. Basically they donate electrons, they neutralize. So free radicals are just things stealing electrons and they neutralize this. They give them some. And, and so the antioxidant stimulates our immune function. It can be a bi uh, it, it helps us be healthier. It's helping us respond to pathogens. And of course there's a lot of fruit um, in our lives when we think about antioxidants. We're always thinking about the different things we eat and the berries, right? So they always talk about blueberries being really high antioxidants, and then there's other sort of fruit that might not have as high antioxidant. Same thing here in uh, the berries that the birds are eating, they vary the amount of antioxidants. And so birds vary in their ability to neutralize those free radicals, and that does have a lot to do with their health and what they're eating. Um, so this is just to kind of 
who said, this is a study, a uh, graduate student of mine did, Yoshi Obuchi, uh, and he was looking, this is when we had two study sites, one was native, one's non-native, and found that catbirds uh, and uh, swings, uh, catbirds, sorry, uh, when they were in the native habitat had better antioxidant capacity. That means their ability to neutralize those free radicals was much better. And we also, just to point out, it's not just by catching birds, we were tracking them with radios so that we knew where they were. Um, <coughs> swings and stretches, we didn't see any difference. And then this is a busy slide, uh, and I just want to point out, we talk about, so there's different types of antioxidants, carotenoids is one of type of antioxidant. And so this is just a slide that shows you carotenoid levels. That's not the only antioxidant. It's not the only one that has a uh, capacity to neutralize free radicals. But multifloral rose has the highest. No bird eats multifloral rose. That's an invasive, but it also has no pulp. There's just nothing but it's basically seed there. Uh, so then you can just see the variation in that. So interesting, dogwood, which makes sense a little bit if you think about the berries on dogwood, has very low carotenoid. Doesn't, it's not pink, right? It's not red. But that, again, I wanted to point out that doesn't mean everything because then if you look at just antioxidant capacity, regardless of what type of antioxidant they have, you'll see that buckthorn actually is pretty good. We have spice bush that's um, pretty good. And actually, the second here is dogwood. Um, and then multiflora rose isn't um, as high. So we're going to be doing more of this, just trying to really understand more about the fruit and the value of the fruit and all sorts of the micronutrients, the macronutrients in relation to what the birds are eating. Because one of the things that we want to find out is on the study site is we recapture some of these birds. Like I told you about the swings and stretch. If they're gaining fat, if they're getting heavier, that's good. That means our study site is good for birds. If they're losing weight or they don't stay there at all because there's no food there, that's not a good sign. So we use this as an indicator for the health of the habitat and the quality of that stopover habitat. So this is incredibly important for us to know. So the take home here is that native shrubs are important for the health of migrating birds. Um, there is a lot of variation. This is really what brings home the whole value of long-term data sets. It's critical. So I wanted to just end here, just to give you uh, where this all went. So we were just doing research, uh, not just doing research, but not doing research on this uh, birds out there. And we realized, one, it's pretty awesome migration, and we had an opportunity. We had an opportunity to open up our science to the public, because why not? Why not fully engage and be transparent about how we do science and who doesn't want to see birds up close? So what we did is we opened it up in 2013 to the public and it's been amazing. Um, our thing is uh, we've had a lot of, uh, well, I'll, I'll show you pictures and you'll get an idea. Uh, one, I want to point out we have a lot of diversity. We, in the six years, we've caught 23,000 birds. This is a two month field season. Um, of over of 133 species. These are all birds that we've captured at our site, um, pictures of the birds at the capture. So quite a bit of diversity. And so what we did is we revised what we were doing. And we not only doing research, but we're a place to train people to become wildlife professionals because the undergraduate students can work there in the morning and go to class in the afternoon. And we can engage people. We can get people connected to nature. Having a bird in your hand, there is nothing that beats that, on my opinion. Um, <laughs> to make someone go, oh, what does this bird eat? Or where is this going? Or, you know, that sort of, there's a sense of awe. So that has been really what we've done. And there's so much uh, that has come out of that that I didn't expect. We get a lot of visitors. Uh, this is kids going on net run with one of the field techs, just following along, checking nets for birds. Uh, this is a class that was going through, and so they can see and feel that mist net and how soft it is. We can then share, share with them something about the bird, point out things you would never see 
if you're looking for the binoculars. We can get a bird on the hand. Blue jays, they always you put them if you, on the back, they just like, they just sit there. And so that's what they do. The blue jay thing is a hummingbird thing. Um, you place them on their hand, and then they take off. We then work with a lot of different groups and schools, uh, bringing them out so they can see science in action. So these are some other groups. We do this both uh, out in the field now. We're doing some things actually um, in the winter as well. Uh, this is at our new field station, actually, these two pictures recently that we opened Quarry Marsh Ecological Research Center that allows us to actually then bring people that have mobility limitations. The idea is trying to make it more handicapped accessible. And large buses. But one of the biggest things for me that's been huge about this is that scientists, I don't know if you heard, not the best communicators. <laughs> <laughs> and... That's not okay. We need to be better. We need to communicate science. It's relevant. We need to communicate relevance. All these undergrads went into the program in fisheries and wildlife because they didn't want to be around people. <laughs> and there you go. And you know what? They love it. They, this is what they have to learn how to do. And so they're learning how to communicate science and the joy they get out of that has been to me the greatest reward because they realize that to them when they see they tell someone you know something about that bird and you look at their face that's really rewarding so they actually started an outreach club in our department after this and so this has become a big thing is learning how to communicate science to the public and so these are just some of the students. Yes, they caught a barred owl one day in the nets. I was in the airport. They sent me a picture. <laughs> and you might see uh, people are generally happy. We love that everyone's happy. So really it's about, for us, connecting people to nature. So we do research. It's always going to be the heart of what we do. But we have an opportunity to really make um, more people in see that, see how we study birds and why we study them and why we should, uh, want, should want to. And so, basically, as Frank Chapman, you know, the poor historian, he didn't arouse in you some strong admiration for these amazing birds. And so, hopefully, some of what I've said has had given you a sense of awe for migratory birds as well. And just to uh, end with this is who makes it possible. There's just too many people. I have an amazing group of people. Right now we have 14 people working out on the crew, um, funders, donors, and so forth. So thank you. <laughs> Questions? Uh, I have all I've often heard that poison ivy berries are pretty important food for birds. Yeah, so later in the season, I think closer to winter, you'll find that birds are eating them. I don't know a lot about the nutrient content of them. Uh, we don't have a, interestingly, we don't have a lot of poison ivy on our site. What we have is mostly poison sumac. Okay. And sumac, not so much because it's most not much pulp. Yeah. What about oriental bittersweet? Uh, so oriental bittersweet has some value a little bit, uh, but what we find is birds don't really eat much of it. So we have it on our study site too. I don't really have any data because we don't have any fe many fecal samples for oriental bittersweet because they're not really seem to eating it. Yeah. And then, uh, our birds, uh, they're migrating regularly, tested for diseases. So they're not, and there's a reason why we don't test for diseases. So my other part of my life is about disease in birds. And the reason that we don't test for diseases is because most diseases are fleeting. So for example, a bird that gets West Nile virus, uh, which they're the primary reservoir for it, will only have that virus present in their system for maybe three days. So that's looking for a needle in a haystack. Eastern equine encephalitis, which the birds are also the primary reservoir for, one and a half to two days at most will you be able to find that virus. So we don't look for it. And ticks will look for it. You know, they might be carrying a tick with the bacteria, but typically not viruses. We will look maybe for some 
malaria, parasites in birds, but those aren't infectious to humans. And the other one we might look for is influenza. But again, they only shed it for about five days. So. I have a question about pokeweed. Yes. Is that a, I have seen fairies, but I don't like pokeweed. Is that yeah, you know, that's such a good question, and I should know the answer, and I don't really know. I was I have pokeweed all over my yard, and I really agree with you. I don't like it, uh, and I don't notice the birds eating it. Okay. So I need to look into sort of okay. pokeweed and what the what we know about that. Yeah, that's a good question. What are the birds that we see now that are migrating together in big flocks and so forth? What are the what are now? Michigan. Yeah, so right now you're getting huge flocks of uh, robins. There's gonna be some flocks of robins going through. We always get um, uh, wax wings. Uh, a lot of warblers right now still we're on the tail end of warbler time peak warblers uh, but yellow rump warblers are coming in kinglets are coming in right now in big numbers uh, white-throated sparrows uh, swains and thrushes are still pretty big that's one of our more common species uh, we're still getting magnolias there's lots of birds i think we caught uh, 35 species yesterday What's the youngest uh, child that you mentioned you want to see there as a volunteer? And second is, are you banning the non-migratory birds? We do ban non-migratory birds. We'll ban, if we catch cardinals and chickadees and so forth, we'll ban them as well. And actually, it's nice to do that because we get recaptures from one year to the next. Because uh, birds that winter or breed in a place, they are site faithful, so they'll come back or if they stay. Uh, stopover sites, we've, in the, in the I don't know, 20, over 25 years I've been doing this, never recaptured a bird on the same stock oversight from one year to the next. They don't use the same, it's just, they just land where they land. Uh, what was the first question you had? Uh, Youngest. Stage child that you about. So we what have, yeah, I mean, basically our goal, our thing with volunteers is you show up and we want to see that you're going to keep showing up and you show up, you like mornings. <laughs> And then we'll start training. And for young kids, you, it seems like we're only doing once they get their driver's license because their parents don't want to um, drive them every time. So, but we, if we have student kids that come repeatedly and show that dedication, we would start doing that. I think we were talking the other day because we had a kid that was nine and that's a little too young. We were thinking more like 12 or 14, yeah. But we've had kids been coming for like years, so some, that have been coming for five years and she might start volunteering. She's just about to get her driver's license. So. <coughs> Do the birds go through any trauma when they're being caught in the net and then um, touched? There is some birds that stress out. Uh, so the question is, is, do the birds go through any trauma when they're being caught in the nets? And there are certain species that have, that are susceptible to uh, stress. And those are towies. So eastern towies and towies out west get stressed. If we have a towie, they're the first bird that comes out of a net and then the first bird that gets banded. Uh, if you have birds that uh, get really tangled, uh, so some birds don't know to stay still and so they do get tangled, uh, we would then process them quickly. But yeah, there are birds that will get stressed. The thing that we do is we don't just release a bird, we put a band on it because that would if you want to find out if banding is hurting birds, you don't want to bias your data by only banding the birds that don't get stressed, so yeah. And they don't mind being handled. They, it's amazing, they're so calm about it, yeah. I mean, it, you know, sometimes you get birds and you put them on the hand and people are like, why aren't they flying off? And it's like, well, your hand's really warm, especially <laughs> in October, so. Um, I mean, I'm not gonna say I don't know what the bird's going through. I'm sure they're stressed to some extent, but they're fairly calm and resilient, yeah. I mean, I believe in what you're doing. I'm yeah. just curious. No, no, it's a great question. It's an important question. And it's one that we, as with working on the cruise, I always tell everyone, don't ever become, you know, you do what you're doing. Always be sensitive. Yeah. So I heard you speak a lot about common spice bush. Yeah. But I'm not familiar with it. it is, can you buy it? At, yeah. Uh, and is, does it work in, in your landscape? So that's a good question. So the question is, is can you buy a spice bush? Um, does it work in your landscaping? Uh, yes, you can buy it. The one problem with spice bush, it's dioecious. So that means that the males and females are on different, uh, are different plants. And so you have two? You have to have two and you have to know that you get a male and female and it's not always easy to tell. So you got to get quite a few of them. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it makes it a little, I'm learning, I'm trying to actually 
figure out, I think I can figure out now with the male and female. All ours, we have all ours tagged in the um, field that are pink and blue. What, what? And in, in the year around, how would you know what, what's male and what's female if you've got two of you the find, same? Yeah, so you find out in the spring, you'll look at the different types of flowers that are um, basically the buds on them. So you'll be able to tell them apart in the spring. And then, uh, then the females would be the only ones fruiting in the rest of the season. So they, yeah, so the females are the only ones that actually fruit. And then, uh, in terms of growing them in your yard, you need certain conditions. So you, it can't be dry and completely out in the open, uh, like a field. It would have to be. We find them in wet areas or in dry, shadier areas. So. And that's one of the things actually we're doing at the new field station is we're going to um, build a backyard wildlife habitat and we're going to try out planting some of these species because that is the main question we get. What should I be putting in my backyard? And we want to be able to say, well, you put this in your backyard, but it's going to be hard in this condition or easy or whatnot. So do they grow big? They're like this, like this big. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. They're not, but, they're not, but they're kind of uh, uh, have lots of stems. Uh, like and for Cynthia. A little bit, maybe like a forsythia, but they're not, um, yeah, they got broad leaves. They're, um, yeah. Can they handle shade? Yes, yeah, I mean, through the forest, although I don't find them fruiting as much in the shade, so I don't know. I need to learn more about spice bush. This is, I'm fascinated by spice bush because of the variation we get. Um, if you're a property owner and you'd like to have the ability to be able to do some plantings to create a nice little restaurant for birds, um, are there any organizations or have you done anything as far as developing citizen people that are out there to, to tell them the information that you need to know to get started? Yeah, actually, and I don't have a handout. It's from um, colleagues of mine at University of Rhode Island that they created a handout to give people. Uh, it's, and we're going to be working with them to create the same handout for plants here, but it tells you the nutri a nutritional value of all the plants, rooting plants in your area, which have the highest and which ones you should be planting in your yard. Yeah, my and, also question would be, you know, if you've got like 50% woodland, 50% right. going to open space, which is what I'm doing right now is the planting stage. What do I put where? What's right for my soil sample or my soil conditions yeah. and water? Wet table? So, yeah, so the, the, that is really the question is what we want to go towards. So we, um, so we have the banding station and we just opened an ecological field station across the road. It's this old farm, um, and mock farm actually. And we have these plots that, what, that's exact, we are going to test it because right now we can't, I don't have that knowledge myself to say what you should do, but we're going to be working with horticulture, we're going to be working with the native plant societies, um, we're doing a prairie demonstration and also like a shrub um, woodland um, backyard. So I don't know the answer to the question, but it's one of our goals is to be able to answer that question, to guide landowners on how they can essentially do more on their property to bring in more wildlife. Can all birds turn off half of their brain? We learned our ducks could do that, but I didn't know that other birds. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we always know like albatross because they spend most of their time flying for the like 10 years, uh, first 10 years of their life. Yeah, so most birds do what semi-hemispheric sleep. Uh, we know with swings and structures, his colleagues have tested it, but yeah, they'll shut down half of their brain while they're migrating. So, yeah, saves a lot of, yeah. Um, I just wanted to, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Hidden Savannah. It's a nursery that deals with native plants. Okay. And I just purchased from them uh, great dogwood because I'm, which is maybe not good for the birds. No, great dogwood is a fantastic bird. Because I didn't know how it was going, because I came and did a tour up here with Pure Cedar Creek for the bush and shrub tour. And I didn't know where I was going to get these great dogwoods. And I just purchased two and put them in a spot and um, just go online and you can maybe check and see if these bushes and shrubs are available. So Chad has a, oh. and the bushes and shrubs? Well, yeah, I, I don't know what else he has. I just tried the gray dog, but I didn't ask about common spice bush because I don't, I didn't wasn't yeah, aware. Most people bush. don't really think of common spice bush. I don't think it's a plant that you see in many places, and one, it may be because it, it is in wetlands a lot, so, you know. We do have it here yeah. you, okay. quite a bit. I hear about service here too. Is that another name for spice bush? Or no, it's not name? another name. It's a different fruit. We don't actually have service berry at our site, but yeah. Hold it to the plant, but yes. 
it is a good plant. I just don't have any information from our study, but it is a good plant to plant. Yes, service berry is good. Unfortunately, a lot of them are going to be deer grubs, so you should protect them until they get a little bigger. Or even if they don't need to hold down, you have to taste them. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Oh, is that one? Okay. But the banding, especially with small birds, does it throw off their balance when they've got something heavier on one leg? So, yeah, so the bands, uh, the size of the bands have, I mean, they have tested, they are just big enough to get over their, uh, so they can roll over their leg like this, but they don't come off. So the weight, we know the weight doesn't impact the birds. Some birds are a little bit like vireos. They're just sassy and indignant about the world. And so when you put a band on them, they always will spend a little bit of time pecking at it, and then they get over it within a minute. But What are they made of? The band? Uh, they're made out of um, these aluminum and steel. So they used to be aluminum, now they're steel. Yeah, very light. I, and I should have brought some with me. I always have, yeah. You, and there's, if you find a bird, ever hit your window? And it's done or on your porch, look at the band because on that band I'll have the number and I'll have an internet address <laughs> and you report it and that's how we get our information. So we've had birds that were hit windows in Indiana, Mississippi uh, and then we had a black and white warbler that we banded in September and it was recaptured at a banding station in Belize in April. So that's wow. the value of banding. Cool. Yeah. Just another really quick question on that is the impact of light pollution and are you studying that at all, uh, spending time, or is there any branch that's working on that? Yes, yeah, so the like, question is about light pollution in birds. Yes, I'm not studying it, but quite a few of my colleagues are studying that. Noise pollution and light pollution are a big deal uh, for birds. I would say just in terms of migratory birds, and lights are a big deal, and that's uh, Chicago is one of the amazing cities that turns off its lights and skyscrapers at 11 p.m. during migration. And that's for impact, but as far as affecting their migratory patterns, yeah. is it how big a factor is it? I think it it's a factor. factor. Well, we're finding that, I don't know as much about their migratory patterns necessarily. It's affecting, I think, their breeding. Um, and I've been reading more about noise pollution because one of the things we're finding out with noise pollution, which isn't what you're asking, I realize, but is that the birds can't hear the songs as well <coughs> because there's so much noise and that's affecting how much they're singing or how what kind of song they have. The folks I know doing light pollution are doing this in uh, my a colleague in Delaware. And actually, they just came out with a study, and I can't remember exactly what they were finding, to be honest with you. But yeah. You could go online and find it. You can, yeah. There's a big study that just came out actually fairly recently out of Delaware, I'm pretty sure. Yeah.